God is good, amen? Thank you for that beautiful song. My subject today is entitled, Making All Things New. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, we praise you. I ask that we might leave here as new people because we have been with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Revelation, the 21st chapter, verse 5, it says that he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And this is good news to our hearts today. Because you see, according to Scripture, sin brought death, so death spread everywhere in the world. It spread to everyone. Creation is now subject to subjected to corruption and frustration and decay. Basically what Paul is saying is that because of sin, everything eventually breaks down, wears out, runs out, or falls out. And based on some of the glistening heads in the horizon, you are very aware of this reality. I mean, have you ever woken up early in the morning and walked by the mirror, you know, before you beautified yourself and, and saw yourself in the mirror and thought, Lord, have mercy, I'm falling apart. You know, that's the thing about age. And I know some of you young people feel like it's never going to come, but it's coming. And every year it seems like I, I, I you know, the, you, you get hair where you don't want it and you lose hair where you want it. And we do all kinds of things to stay new. You know, we, we go get the new car. You know, we get the new clothes. We get the new diets. We, 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 we have the new hairstyles. We get into the new gym routine. We get a new therapist because, you know, they were the problem. <laughs> you know, we begin a new moisturizing regimen. You know, next time you're in the drugstore, I want you to walk through the moisturizing section. And I want you to just read some of the titles of the product that they sell. Age-defying serum. Wrinkle eraser. One of my favorites, age blocker. I don't care how much you put on your face, it ain't blocking no age. Based on the descriptions, you would think they found the fountain of youth and bottled it. But then you read the ingredients, and it's just sunblock. But you see, sunblock doesn't sell youth cells. New cells, because deep down, everybody knows we're wearing out. And it doesn't matter what we do, we can do things to try to, you know, prevent it from happening as quickly as it happens, but the reality is everybody's wearing out. I mean, turn on the news and you will see a world that is wearing out. But the good news is that Jesus says from the throne, behold, I am making all things new. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with this reality as well, coming from a different angle. And he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making an appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And that's ultimately what this word reconciliation means. It's, it's this word that means restoring things to the way they used to be. Restoring things to the way they should be. And so God wants to use his people to restore things to the way they should be, the way God designed them to be. 
This word reconciliation, it's a word that means restoring something to its original factory sealed condition. Before it was broken, before the breakup, before the breakdown, before the betrayal, before the bad divorce, before the bad diagnosis, before the bad decision. According to Paul, God's got one goal for this planet and every person in it, and that is reconciliation. Behold, I am making all things new. In Greek, there are two words most often used for new. Kainos and neos. Now, neos is this word that means fresh. It means young. It means not been around, a newborn neos. Not been around very long. But kainos is different. Kainos, which is also translated new, isn't talking about the age of something or the duration of something, but the quality of something. It's a word that means unknown, strange, remarkable, only recently discovered. That is the newness of Revelation 21. According to Revelation 21, this is pretty cool, through Christ, we can have the kainos without the naos. Now that does not make any sense to us because in this world, in, in our reality, we have to be nails to be Kano. Something has to be young in order to be new. But Jesus is saying, in me, you can become newer the older you get. Hallelujah. Our marriages can become newer the older they get. My youngest son, my, uh, my wife and I were going to go out on a date together uh, just a few months ago. My youngest son, Taylor, who's nine and he recently turned 10, you know, he, he, he often goes wherever we go, you know, he's attached, he's my shadow. And we were going out together on a date and, and uh, Brittany, my wife said, well, well, dad and I are going to just go alone. We're going on a date. And I saw his perplexed face, you know. And so he thought about that for a little bit, and then he comes up to me a little bit later, and he says, Dad, Dad, uh, you know, I really want to go, but Mom says you guys are going on a date. And I said, yeah, that's right. He goes, but Dad, old people don't go on dates. (laughs) You know, that's pretty sad. But you know what, friends? Let me tell you, I'm talking to some married couples today. The day you stop dating is the day your marriage just starts dying. And this is the beauty of of Christ and keeping Christ at the center of our relationship is that our marriages can actually become newer and more exciting the older they get. Our faith can become newer the older it gets. Our churches can become newer and more relevant the older they get. Our ministries can become newer and more relevant the older they get. It is God's newness. You know how you've read a, a verse a million times, but then there was that time where in that moment it just hits you and it's like you had never seen it before? It brand new. That is the newness of God. That is the kainos of Christ. The word of God is from the ancient of days, but it hits you right where you needed it. That's God's newness. When you return that 10% of your tithe, look, I don't know how it works. I just know it works. Because in our math, you take away 10% and you got less. But in God's math, you, you return 10% and you get more. The, he opens the windows of heaven and he pours out the newness of God on your life. That is God's newness, the kainos without the naos. Behold, I'm making all things new. Behold, you are a new creation It's important to understand that revelation is not only for the future and it's not only about the past, but it's also about right now. Jesus says, I am he he who is, was, and is to come. Here in Revelation, we hear this, write down what you have seen, things that are now and things that will happen. You see, revelation was written for the now and the not yet. And so today we're going to learn two brief points about the newness of Christ. The newness that we can have now and the newness of not yet. The newness of now and the newness of not yet. 
When Jesus says, behold, I'm making all things new, the verb making is in the present tense. It's active, it's indicative, it is present progressive. So Jesus doesn't say, I will make all things new in the future. He's saying, I am making all things right now in the present. I'm working on your marriage right now. I'm working and, and, and I'm, I'm helping you in that situation right now. I am working on that job problem right now. I am reconciling you right now. My newness has entered into your life right now. You see, too often when we talk about the newness of God, it's only in reference to the future when Christ returns. But friends, we can experience the newness of Christ right now. When you study what Jesus said and what the early apostles preached, it wasn't just some distant event. It was a present reality. It wasn't the Messiah is coming. It was the Messiah has come. Not the kingdom is coming, but has come and is accessible right now in the person of Christ. Friends, I want to be clear. I, cannot, I am a proud Seventh-day Adventist, and I cannot wait until I see my king pierce through the, the sky and every eye to see him. I long for that day. But the fact is, is if something does not change, many of our churches will not make it until Jesus comes. We need some of that newness now. When you look at the statistics of the church, it is in a steady, incredible decline. We are hemorrhaging young people. We're not going to have a church if we don't do something about it. We need the newness of Christ right now. We need to get active in the Leeds program right now. We need to be on earth as it is in heaven right now here. Some of our finances won't make it till Jesus comes. We need some of that newness right now. Can I get a witness? Some of our marriages won't make it another month, let alone another year. We need some of the newness of, of Christ right now. Our communities need the newness of God right now. Our cities need the newness of God right now. Christ said, you are the salt of the earth. You do know what the purpose of salt was in ancient times. The purpose of salt was primarily used for two things, a preservative. It was to hold the meat together, all right? It was to hold the meat together. It was to keep it from decaying. Jesus was saying the church is supposed to keep the world from falling apart. And the second thing that it was used for was to make things taste better. Christians are called to make life taste better, not worse. Our cities need the newness of God right now. The terrible shooting at Robb Elementary School, and there's been another shooting, and there's been another shooting. Friends, we need the newness of Christ right now seen in the lives of Christians here today. We've got to stop. Look, Christianity is not a spectator sport. We have got to become on earth as it is in heaven right now. We need the newness of Christ to enter into our lives right now. Listen to me. 20 years ago, for those of you who were here on Thursday night, you heard my story. But 20 years ago when I was living out of my car, when I was on the verge of homelessness, when I was tore up from the floor up, I had four felony charges, I had a warrant for my arrest, man, my relationships were hanging by a thread, I was knocking on death's door to drug addiction, I had given up on life, I needed the newness of the gospel right then, I could not wait till Jesus came to give me newness, I needed a gospel that gave me newness now. I needed a gospel that not only saved me from some future hell, but a present hell. In recovery, we have a saying that religion, religion is for those who are afraid of going to hell, but recovery are for those who've already been to hell and don't want to go back. <laughs> Man, society was done with me. My family was so hurt by me. Friends were done with me. I was done with me. But hallelujah, my God wasn't done with me. And there that night in that treatment center in the middle of nowhere, 
over 19, almost 20 years ago, I got down on my knees after contemplating walking out that door and dying, I got down on my knees and I received Christ into my life, his unmerited favor, his perfect power of grace into my life. And let me tell you, his newness started breaking into my life right then. And it wasn't easy because, you see, reconciliation takes work. Restoring something back to the way it was takes work. Hallelujah, my wife and I, Celebrated 24 years of marriage this last year. God is good, amen? But let me tell you, that reconciliation, that takes work. That took commitment, recommitment. It isn't easy. Reconciliation takes work. Restoring something is a process. But hallelujah, I wasn't alone. You see, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. There's that word kainos again. It's present. It's not you will be a new creation. It is you are in Christ right now a new creation. You don't got to put your miracle on layaway. Hallelujah. You can experience it right here today. It's also the King James Version says new creature, but... The actual Greek is new creation. See, it's a work in progress. Hallelujah, I'm a work in progress. God ain't done with me yet, amen? (laughs) You see, it's a continue. Just Just as God did not create this earth overnight, he did it over the process of six days. Hallelujah, your recreative process, your new creation is a process over a period of time. When you want to know what heaven is all about, you just got to look at the three and a half year ministry of Jesus Christ. And during the three and a half year ministry of Christ on earth, when he referred to his kingdom, it was almost always in reference to the now, not later. So Jesus went around and he did everything that heaven is going to all be about. He sets the captives free. He gives sight to the blind. He forgives sin. He even raises people from the dead. You see, he was bringing the future finished kingdom into people's present. And that's what the church is called to do. You know, we love to brag about our eschatology But listen to me, church, good eschatology is not only about the future, it's about the presence of the future in the right now. You see, not only did Christ's death and resurrection provide a way to go to heaven someday, but it provided a way for heaven to appear in the lives of people right now. And you know what, sometimes, and and again, I grew up as an Adventist, and I believe in everything that we teach, but sometimes I wonder if placing all the emphasis of God's newness and recreation at the second coming, if we're trying to let ourselves off of the hook from becoming God's kingdom right now. Ah, Jesus, when he comes again, he'll sort all this stuff out. He'll sort out all the hatred that I have in my heart when he comes back. How in the world can God, how can he give us eternity with each other when we can barely handle an hour with each other? How can God give us every nation, kindred, tongue when there's still segregation and separation going on? Jesus will sort it out when he comes back, the addiction. I couldn't go to the church when I needed to get clean. I had to go somewhere else. I should have been able to go to the church. I couldn't get honest about what I was going through. I couldn't get real. They would have chased me out of that church. We created a program called Unchained Hope and Healing from Addiction. It's a 10-part series, virtual series, and... Uh, one, of, one of the pastors I had the privilege of, of working with in this conference... He was one of my externs. He came up to me. He was so excited about this program, and he's nowhere in this union. He's way off somewhere in the distant world. Um, and, and he came up to me. He said he was so excited about Unchained. He wanted to use it as his church, but he was told by the board, we don't want those people here. And, and yet you think you're getting ready for heaven? You see, this, it, it's broken. It's broken. 
Let him deal with it. When he comes back, he'll deal with the hate, the injustice. But friends, listen to me today. Saving souls for the future while neglecting them in the present is not the gospel. You cannot get ready for heaven while letting our communities go to hell. You know, one of the most ancient of heresies was something called Gnosticism. Gnostics believed uh, it, 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 it infiltrated the church at its very beginning. This Hellenistic idea, this Greek idea, the Gnostics believed that knowledge was the path to salvation. In fact, our word knowledge comes from that Greek, Greek word, root word, word. Salvation by knowledge. They believe that you were saved by what you knew and not by who you knew. Sounds like some people I know. Maybe Gnosticism's not too terribly far away. They believed that the physical world did not matter, only the spiritual world. They believed, you know, this is where the idea of the immortality of the soul came from. This is where eternal torment came from. This is where it came from when you die, you go straight to heaven came from. I mean, this all came from this Gnostic idea of shedding this mortal coil so that you can go up to heaven in some kind of vapor. It taught that the physical world did not matter, only spiritual you see, Gnosticism is so much easier than the gospel, than Christian mission, because you don't have to worry about things like justice. You don't have to worry about things like poverty. You don't have to worry about things like equity and unity. Just live a really spiritual life off to yourself, and one day you'll get eternal life. But friends, real Christianity is living for the future kingdom right now. So the question is, how can God begin making all things new in your life? We're going to go quickly here, friends. Revelation 21.5 tells us, it says that he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. The kainos of Christ, the newness of Christ comes from his throne. And the moment we stopped doing what God said for what we wanted, the world started to unravel. Things started falling apart. Isaiah 14, this is where it originated. To Lucifer, Satan, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I'll set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. You see, God's good creation started falling apart when we started sitting on God's throne and calling the shots. And this is what Paul is getting at in Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. That's physical, spiritual, emotional, mental. That's your whole self. It's not just talking about living a healthy life. It's, it's, it's all of you. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And if you do that, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know what the root word for renewal is here? Kanos. What Paul is saying is if you want to be renewed, you got to be willing to give up control over your life. you got to turn over the controls to God. Listen to me today, friends. I can guarantee you the areas in your life that are falling apart today, the ones that are wearing out the most, are the areas that you've surrendered least. As I travel the Southern Union and I visit a lot of different churches, listen to me, the churches that are dying the most are the ones willing to surrender the least. According to the verse in Revelation 21, if we want God to begin making all things new, we got to be willing to get off of his throne because that's where the newness of Christ comes from. So if you're not seeing the progress you want to see, you don't have a power problem, you got a management problem. You see, you're trying to be the controller of your own destiny, the captain of your own ship. You know, that's why one of the dumbest things ever made were the bumper stickers that says, Jesus is my co-pilot. <laughs> that is the most ridiculous thing. Like, like you're sitting there flying the plane like, Jesus, what do you think if we go fly through this? No, you, you don't ask Jesus for his opinion. Jesus has to be the pilot. You got to get out of the passenger seat because you know you. You'll grab a hold of the wheel you can't even sit in the back seat. You need to pray, Holy Spirit, I want you to tie up my hands, gag me, and throw me in the trunk. Yeah. 
Because listen to me, friends, my best decisions have produced some of my worst predicaments. What the disciples thought was going to win the world to Jesus would have ruined the world for Jesus. The thing that you think the church needs may be the worst thing for the church. You got to give up control. You got to get off of his throne. The church isn't your church, it's God's church. You see, the reason we're not seeing more of God's newness in our churches is because we're not willing to let go. Isaiah says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? You see, this is the problem. We want to see God do a new thing, but without having to change a thing. We want God to do a new thing while we keep doing the same thing. But you do know the definition of insanity, right? Listen to me, church. If we want God to make all things new, we got to get off of his throne and get out of the way. God cannot resurrect what we will not surrender. God cannot renew what we will not release. He can't give us a future until we let go of the past. Do you want survival or revival today? If you want revival, then you got to surrender all things under the throne. And you'll notice Jesus says, I'm making all things new, not some things. So you don't get to say, okay, Lord, I'll let you resurrect this part of the service, just not that part of the service. You know, we'll let you resurrect the preacher because he needs it. But we, but hands off the order of service because that came down from Sinai. Man, let me tell you right now, some of you got to just cut that order of service up. Can we please worship more? Last time I checked, announcements doesn't change anybody's life. Let's worship God more. Get rid of all the pomp and circumstance and let's worship God in spirit and truth. You got to get off of his throne. He's going to do all things. You don't get to delegate what he renews and what he changes. We don't get to say, okay, God, you can use that person, but not this person. We don't get to say, okay, Lord, you can change this part, but not that part. Sorry. We don't get to micromanage our miracle. God said, Richie, you want me to change you and use you and turn you into an agent of reconciliation? You've got to die and get out of the way. Because, Richie, you don't need Jesus for a few things. You need me for all things. Too often our approach to God is like some sort of glorified personal assistant. We we just kind of run things by, but we're ultimately the ones calling the shots. That doesn't work, and you'll never experience the newness of Christ that way. His making all things new is contingent on putting all things under his throne. We got to let go of it so God can take hold of it and inject some new life into it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm talking about your mind. I'm talking about your money. I'm talking about your marriage. It's not your money anyway. God blessed you with that money. I'm talking about your marriage. God, did, man, you, come on now. You know it was just an act of the Holy Spirit that you found someone who would even think about marrying you. <laughs> come on, and that you're still married today? That is a miracle. you got to keep surrendering, and any marriage knows if you're going to make it, you better keep surrendering that stuff under the throne room of grace. I don't care what it is. You got to, if you want the newness of Christ, you got to surrender all things under the throne. You see, that's why I keep the Sabbath. It's not because it makes me any more savable, because the last time I checked, uh, it were Sabbath keepers, diet observers, uh, dress reformers who crucified cross, Christ to the cross. So the Sabbath doesn't make me any more savable than I was. I'm saved by grace. No, but the reason I keep the Sabbath is because the Bible says that in the future finished kingdom, we're going to be keeping it, and I can use as much future finished kingdom in my present as I can get. I want the rest. I want that powerful rest that we get to have in heaven. We get to taste it right now in the Sabbath. You know, that beautiful freedom without the boss hanging over our back, without the money handcuffing our lives, we get to experience some freedom from that right now through the Sabbath. Are you ready for renewal, church? 
starts submitting everything under his throne. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes perhaps the longest, most detailed chapter in all of his letters discussing the future final resurrection. But notice how he finishes it. It's not by saying, therefore, since you have such a great hope, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride, and just sit back and wait till Jesus comes. No. What does he say? Well, let me go back there, and I'll tell you what he said. <laughs> therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that, the Lord, that, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Don't you see, friends, Christians are resurrection people right now. The church is called to be a foreshadowing of what's coming, the love that's coming, the unity that's coming, the every nation, kindred, tongue that's coming. And you see, that's why the church is the, as, as bad and, and as much as we fall short, the church is the closest thing to heaven as you can come to on this earth. Because you tell me one place where we have such a melting pot of different people. Hallelujah. Every race is here. Every ethnicity is here. We got Democrats here. We got Republicans here. And we're all here to praise the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We are called to be a foreshadowing of the future finished triumphant kingdom right now. But we got to begin. He who began a good work and you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's when he finishes the work. But before something can finish, it has to begin. Stop putting your miracle on layaway. Last point, short point, the newness we have coming. Have you ever taken a picture of something that you saw in person that was absolutely amazing, but then when you look at the picture, it looked pretty pitiful? Yeah, I'll be on my way home after a board meeting or something, and... And, you know, there'll be this massive full moon. It just looks like this giant white plate in the sky. It's massive. I'll take a picture of it. I'll go home and tell my family, check this picture out. And it's just like a little dot. <laughs> you know? It just doesn't do it justice. Who here's ever been to the Grand Canyon? You know when you get to the Grand Canyon, it is absolutely breathtaking. In person, it's incredible. You know, this person's a little scared of height, so I don't get too close to the edge. But I, as close as I could get, man, I saw it, and it was just absolutely incredible. But, you know, and as good, I've seen some pretty good pictures of the Grand Canyon, but they just don't do it justice. They don't do it justice. They don't actually do a good job at revealing what the actual thing is. That's what Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians 2.9. When he says, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. Listen to me, friends. When you turn on the news, it may be hard to believe that one day Christ is going to completely renew this world. It may be hard to believe that instead of nations and ethnicities and races fighting, we're going to be worshiping together, living together in perfect peace. And again, this doesn't mean we say, okay, well, one day God's going to do it. No, we gotta, it's got to begin now. But when justice falls short, and it inevitably will, when the school shootings continue, and they inevitably will, when the dear saint who acts more like a demon than a saint puts her foot in your ma her mouth, when things still seem to be falling apart, Paul says, remember, there is a newness that is coming that, that sin can no longer infect. There is a newness that is coming that no one can stop. And Paul says, that's what I consider. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. What Paul is saying is when bad things happen, when you're not seeing the kainos of Christ in the situation, I want you to consider the newness that's coming. The, the pain you're experiencing right now doesn't hold a candle to the joy and peace you got coming. When Jesus finishes reconciling what sin ruined, man, relationships are going to be restored. Our bodies will be completely new. Paul was saying, look, they can take your present life, but they can never touch your future life. They can take your house, but they can't take your home. They can take your position, but they cannot touch your place. They can take your job, but they can't touch your calling. There is a newness that's coming that no one can stop when he will wipe away every tear from their eyes 
and death shall be no more. There shall now, not, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. You see, friends, your biggest problems are already passing away. The Alzheimer's and the dementia, it, it, the countdown has begun. It's passing away. The bad debt and the bill collectors, hallelujah, is passing away. The politicians, hallelujah, is passing away. Tears are passing away. How do I know? Well, because of the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world away. The cause of all the pain and death in the world. In the movie, The Passion, there's this scene towards the end. Jesus is on his way to Calvary. And he's completely exhausted, burdened by the weight of the cross. And our sin, your sin, my sin. And he falls down to the ground. He, he had the, the weight of all the sins in the world weighing him down. And he falls to the ground and his mother runs to him as any good mother would. And he looks into his mother's eyes, and as the music comes to this powerful crescendo, he says, see, mother, I make all things new. Now, if you look in the Gospels, you're not going to find that statement there. I know that. But you need to know today, it's in the Bible. In Revelation, Jesus says, behold, I am making all things new. And you know what? Even though the Bible doesn't record Jesus saying that on Good Friday, it's very appropriate because you see, it was through Christ's death that one day there will be no more death. It was because Christ took our full weight of sin that one day there will be no more sin. It's because Christ was willing to be torn apart that, that, that we ultimately will not fall apart. Romans 5, 10 says, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? Because he experienced crucifixion, we can now experience resurrection, not just in the future, but right now. Hallelujah, because, because of Christ's crucifixion, one day we get to experience what the author of Hebrews in, 11, in Hebrews 11.35 calls a better resurrection. After the resurrection, the first thing Jesus shows to the disciples is his scars. You know Why? It's because when the disciples watched the nails go into Jesus' hands, they thought their lives were over. Those nails had just ruined their plans for Jesus. And they choked, and they denied him, and they disappeared. But check it out. The very thing they thought had ruined their lives had actually saved their lives. The very thing they thought was a sign God had deserted them became the ultimate sign that God loved them. The only one throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity who will have any scars. Christ will live with his scars forever so that one day you can have a scarless body. So that you can have a better resurrection. Just because you don't see anything good coming out of your situation doesn't mean it can't. you got to hold on. There is a newness that's coming. It's called a better resurrection. Man, in the better resurrection, we don't just get people back temporarily. We get them back for eternity. We don't just get it back. We get it back, but better. We get the body back, but without the arthritis, better. We get our family back, but without the disease, better. We get our parents back, but without the depression, better. We get our kids back, but without the addiction, better. We get the planet back, but without the pollution and the politician, better. We get our life back, but this time without death. Hallelujah, there's a newness that's coming. On the day everything sad comes untrue, all the pain we went through will make our joy greater. You will find that the worst things that happen to you in this life, in the end, will only enhance your eternal life. When God turns everything inside out, you will come to know a joy beyond the walls of this world. Jesus is saying to each person here today, embrace me, and every death will turn to a resurrection. Every failure will turn to a victory. Every wrong will eventually be made right. Every Sorrow will eventually turn to gold. Hallelujah. There is a newness that's coming. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the awesome God that you are. For all that you have done and all that you are doing in the lives of your people. Lord, I thank you. And that Revelation 21.5 says, Behold, I am making all things new right now. The newness has begun in your church. 
And when you taught us to pray, you said, pray for on thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are called to be a reflection of the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I pray you would fill this place, this church, with the newness of Christ right now. But Lord, we've got to surrender all things under your throne. Lord, I don't know what each person here needs to surrender today, but Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, they would surrender it to you. Because there is nothing you ask from us that you don't have something bigger and better for us. There is nothing you take from us that is good for us. And there you, there's nothing you allow us to go through that isn't. So Lord, I pray for the newness of Christ to fill each life here today. And that we will surrender all things under your throne. That we will give up the control so that the canos of Christ can fill our lives. And Lord, on those days where we don't know how we're going to make it, when the pain is flaring up, and when the, when, when the bad diagnosis still come, when the bad news still erupts, I pray, Lord, that we will rem remember there is a newness that's coming. The better resurrection is coming. I want to be there that day. I pray each person here today is there as well. May we leave here as new people because we have been with Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.